And now we go to canonical quantization. So what is the idea of canonical uh, quantization? Is that the idea is that you, uh, you identify what are the canonical conjugate variables of your theory. So for the electromagnetic field, for each mode of the electromagnetic field, we will elect the two quadratures as canonical conjugate variables. And we impose that they satisfy, they, are oper they, have, they, they become operators that satisfy this commutation relation, which is typical of canonical conjugate variables, just as the position and momentum of a quantum particle. Okay? So these are the canonical conjugate variables. They, they, uh, and also, we can build from these canonical conjugate variables the, the so-called annihilation and creation operators and also the number operator, which is A dagger A, for each mode, for each mode, okay? Are you? Okay, it's working. So, uh, so uh, of course, we can follow the steps of the usual theory of the quantum harmonic oscillators. This commutation relation between uh, the operators are given by, uh, by, by this commutation of A with A dagger is 1, is the identity operator. And this, from this commutation relation, we can show that the, the, the eigenvalues, eigenvalues of this operator here uh, are natural numbers, natural numbers, okay? So this is the main, uh, the main course of action, and the, the, the eigenvectors are called the Fox states, or the number states. So these are numbers of well-defined numbers, a uh, well-defined number of excitations in the field. So the energy, uh, with this, uh, uh, so this is the, the rule, uh, the, as we uh, act the annihilation operation, we remove one way excitation, uh, one uh, eigenvalue here, one unit uh, of the eigenvalue. When we act the creation operator, we increase, we add one unit to the eigenvalue. So this is the main idea. And There we go. Okay. So, uh, so we, we can cast the Hamiltonian in the usual way, h bar omega a dagger a plus one, so the, the plus one half, so the number, uh, the number operator plus one half, so the eigenvectors or the eigenenergies are given just as this, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, integer multiples of this basic uh, quantity here, h bar omega, as usual. And now, how do we make the, the, the multi-mode structure? So, we quantize each mode separately, but then we have to build the multi-mode structure of the beam. And the multi-mode vector space is a tensor product between the, te the, the vector spaces of associated to each mode. So this is the big space uh, of the, the, the big vector space uh, of states of the electromagnetic field. So this is, the, for example, the multi-mode uh, uh, Fox states. And also we need to take these operators, the, the, the operators, uh, annihilation and creation operators acting in each vector space and extend them to the big vector space, okay? So the, the extension is just take the product between the, the, the operator 
uh, tensor product of the operator with the identity in all, uh, in all other modes, okay? And then we are, we can write the quantized fields. So the vector, once we have the, 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 the mode structure that we want to, to work with, uh, about that and all, all we need is, 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 to, is to understand that the whole quantum uh, information uh, uh, theory will be, will refer, will talk about the fluctuation properties, correlations and fluctuations between these canonical variables that can be accessed in the lab. Okay? So, for example, if we take Fox states, huh? uh, just a minute, no, I haven't defined them, okay. So, if you take Fox states 
of course, the number in a FOX state, if uh, in a FOX state, the number operator or equivalent, the energy of the electromagnetic field doesn't have fluctuations. So the FOX states are states with well-defined number of photons or well-defined energy of the modes. Okay, so this is uh, very important. And there is another different, another kind of state that is very important also in quantum optics, which is the coherent state. Okay, I, I will define the coherent state on the next lecture, but I will just show you that, in fact, these are states that describe, I will tell you that they are quantum states that describes very well the propagation of a classical field, like a laser beam, okay? They are a good approximation uh, for the quantum state of a laser beam. Uh, and also, in these coherent states, the, no, the number or, the, or the, uh, the photon number or the energy of the electromagnetic field is not well defined. It fluctuates in this way. Also, the coherent state has the following property. When I expand a coherent state, for a given mode, it's a single mode coherent state. In terms of Fox state, we have these coefficients here, and as we uh, compute the probability, the photon number probability distribution for a coherent state, we have this Poissonian distribution. Who has ever seen the Poissonian distribution? Please raise your hand. Great, good. So this is a Poissonian distribution, and these are the average number of photons for the coherent state and the fluctuations that are exactly as I showed over there. So one important, one very important property of a Poissonian distribution, if you have a Poissonian process, is that if you subdivide this process in any way, the subprocess that you have are still Poissonian. This is, will be very important for us. Okay, so suppose you are in a bank, you are computing the arrival of clients on a bank, okay, and you, you realize that it's, it's, a, it's a Poissonian process. Then you subdivide it like that. Now I will compute the process, uh, the, uh, I will just uh, evaluate the process of arrival of people with red shirt and the process of arrival of people with blue shirt and so on with all uh, colors that you have, then you have sub-processes. If the big process is Poissonian, the parts, the sub-processes will all, all of them be Poissonian. And this will be very important for us. I will go back to this property of Poissonian processes too. Okay? So, the, for the quadratures, uh, we have also fluctuations. Uh, for Fox state, the average value of the quadratures is zero. The fluctuations, uh, they, they are like that. They are equal on both quadrature states, and they scale with the number of photons in the state. They are not minimum uncertainty states, we can see. Only if n equal to zero, it becomes a, a minimum uncertainty state. For the coherent state, they, they have a, a given, a, a non-vanishing a non average value of the quadratures. So the average amplitude of the electromagnetic field in a coherent state is not zero. The average value of in a Fox state is zero. But there is energy, and the energy is in the fluctuations. Okay? For the coherent state, no. We have a, an average uh, value of the quadrature that depends on the, on, the, on the complex amplitude alpha. And we have also fluctuations, and the coherent states are minimum uncertainty uh, states, okay? So I, I think that Olivier, uh, I have already mentioned this, you can represent the fluctuations and the average value of a coherent state or any state in the, uh, in the uh, phase space, uh, in phase space plane for a given mode. So you have, we have X, Y, we represent the average uh, values of the quadratures by an arrow here and the uncertainty uh, region by a circle, since this, these are the same, the same uh, fluctuations. So, and we can measure these fluctuations. This is a local oscillator. It's a homodyne detector. You mix the beam that you want to characterize with some reference laser beam, and this amplifies the, the, the noise properties and the fluctuations that you want to measure. So we can access the, the, those uh, variances in the lab. Okay. Um, this is, uh, this is the, 
displacement operator is very important also, is, is how you, you construct a coherent state from a, a, a zero uh, photon state, which is the vacuum state, okay, which is the vacuum state. So it's a zero photon state. Um, so, and the displacement operator is called like that because, because the, the, the uncertainty region in phase space uh, described by the vacuum is this, is just a circle in the origin and as you produce the coherent state acting the, the, the displacement operator on the vacuum, you just displace the, the, the uncertainty region in phase space. This is why it's called the displacement operator. And this is the squeeze, these are the squeeze states also, of course, you can generate, and uh, uh, Olivier uh, mentioned yesterday, this would be a single mode coherent state that Olivier mentioned yesterday. And uh, uh, what happens is that uh, here is that you can conceive states, you can produce states in which uh, you, you diminish the noise in one quadrature with respect to the co coherent uh, state noise, but at the expense of increasing on the other quadrature. So this is why it's squeezed. It's because the, the uncertainty region is, is indeed squeezed, okay? But they are minimal uncertainties uh, uh, states with different noise in the, in the two quadratures. And of course, they, you can also have this mathematical tool to generate the squeeze states starting from the vacuum, from the zero photon state, okay? Oh, this is how you do this. So, uh, with this I can conclude uh, the, today's lecture. Uh, oh, well, I didn't talk about that, uh, actually, this, <laughs> I should remove this here, okay? So, so but actually, this, is, it is a, this paper is important is, is because the first time we talked about this uh, spin orbit non-separability, this structural non-separability in a classical laser beam, uh, vitreization and transverse modes, was in this paper in 2007. So it's 12 years ago it was published, okay? And we were doing this to demonstrate a topological phase that was expected for entangled states in quantum mechanics. And then we said, okay, I can use classical non-separability to measure topological phase. It's, it's a mathematical property of the entangled state and then I can measure it with classical, with classical non-separability. And this was the first time I used. So I, I, I also talked about the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, an application of the, these uh, vector modes in, in quantum cryptography and we discussed the bell, also the realization of quantum gates, teleportation scheme, and we also discussed this bell inequality for the non-separability between polarization and spatial modes. So with the quantization of the electromagnetic field, I will approach on the next lecture the, the, this bell inequality problem again, but now with the quantized modes, input and output modes, and see what's the role played by coherent states and Fox states in this scenario, okay? So thank you very much. Questions now? Thanks a lot. Uh, that's uh, fascinating stuff. I have, you must know, uh, Cla Claude Fabre has been talking about modes a lot. You know, he's preparing a book. And he, he, I saw his talk, and I think it may help to, to put what you said in the perspective that he's, he talks about mode space being a Hilbert space. Mode space? The, the modes form a Hilbert space. So yes. The operators can be seen as basis vectors yeah. for Hilbert space. Yeah. And then it comes as no surprise. I mean, it still surprises me. Mm. But it, it, it mathematically, it makes sense that you can do, uh, like you showed exactly, you can do Bell, uh, Bell inequality type measurements that are purely classical, mm -hmm. that are mathematically structured exactly like the quantum Hilbert space I totally quantum agree. state. And therefore, yeah, you get two square root of two and everybody is, mm -hmm. you know, all, all anxious about it. But the math is exactly the same, and, mm -hmm. and, but it's a classical structure. So it's, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with the way you, the interplay, I think, between the polarization and the, 
and mm -hmm. the special properties and the, and the type of vector modes. And it's mm -hmm. kind of highly non-trivial, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, questions? I have one. I'm always asking about classical stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> you said about uh, this analogy of quantum telep uh, teleportation, quantum, quantum communication, but in these structured modes, do they have some, uh, they can be useful for classical communication? Do they have uh, sp uh, special propagation properties or something like that, about scattering or something like that? Yeah, uh, I think, yes, they, they do have seen works on uh, using vortices to propagate information uh, robust to, for example, fluctuations in the index of refraction of a medium. So if you send something, an image, through the air and it passes through fluctuations in the index of refraction, you can show that somehow the vortice aspects of the vorticity that, that are preserved after this uh, transformation, as, after this uh, transmission. But even this, it's very interesting because uh, we, we know, for example, uh, in, in quantum information, in quantum mechanics, about the decoherence-free subspaces. Also, the same idea, by the way, the, 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 this uh, cryptographic uh, scheme, it, it, was, it, uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was a consequence of a work by Leandro Olita and, uh, and Steve, who were like exactly uh, making the analogy between these vector modes and the coherence-free subspaces. So in the same way that, that certain superpositions of a quantum system is robust to the action of the environment, depending on the kind of action the environment does, uh, these vector beams, they are also robust against certain imperfection of, of propagation. So this is true. Yes, you can use for classical communication, definitely. Uh, when you're deriving uh, Bell inequalities, you make the assumptions of uh, reality and locality, and when you uh, when you violate Bell inequalities, you know one of these two assumptions has been uh, broken. Is there any analogy to this in this scenario? That's a good question. Um, to the locality, I don't know because we are we are as I, as I said uh, in the previous lecture, we are dealing with different degrees of freedom of the same object. So everything is local. There's no locality here. So we cannot evaluate whether. Uh, we cannot, for example, discard the possibility of locality. In regards to reality, I think it's a bit strange because, I don't know, uh, for me, since we are doing theory, everything is real. You see, I mean, the electromagnetic field is real. It's there. It's there. You see, if you, if you touch the, the outlet of the <laughs> outlet, you will see it. it so, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know. So the problem, is of, the problem of reality is, is sometimes is that, okay, you are going to toss a coin. You, you think about this, the spin of a particle as a coin. So does, it, does the coin or does the spin have a predefined state that you just don't know, but it has already a predefined as a result? Is, is this predefined or not? So the reality goes into this question a bit. Which is, which is not even a question for us, okay? When we say that the laser is polarized at 45 degrees, it's not that we, we in classical theory, it doesn't make sense to say, to, to ask yourself whether it's H or V and you don't know. It's, it's both at the same time, okay? So I don't think that reality would, is a question here. This is really interesting. I, I think to, to uh, continue on that, I think everything commutes in, in classical. Uh, I'm sorry? Everything yeah. commutes in classical. Everything commutes. And, and, and when you want to do, people sometimes say, oh, you know, I can make a box and I have a single ball in the box and I put a partition in the box without looking and then the box is over here, there, and there, there you go. I'm making single photon core. Yeah, but you do not have 
the conjugate variable, mm. the one that doesn't commute. And even though you, you can change the state in the eigenstate of the conjugate variable, the state will stay entangled. Classical mm. theory doesn't have that. And I think, I think in, a, in a terms of uh, what Yelena was saying for the, uh, the Bell inequalities, that's ve weighing very heavily. There's no measurement postulate, there's mm -hmm. no projection, and there's, there's no commutators in class. I mean, it's obvious to say that, of course. Mm. But, but it's, it's really the thing that the classical correlate, you can make things that are you know, correlated in classically, mm -hmm. but then you have to find the conjugate variable in which the correlation stays. That's how the EPR paradox will come up come up mm -hmm. and the Bell inequalities will be constructed. Mm -hmm. And in classical physics, there's no problem. Everything commutes. Mm -hmm. right? so yeah. yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> so if there are no more questions, let's thank again.